she made a lot of choices that my instincts in my mind think, well, I don't think I would make those choices. So you start to try and luckily, not luckily, but because this was, I need to stop using that word, but because this was a true story and we had this book as a resource, Evidence of Love, um, it's the only text interview that the woman I play participated in after the trial. She never um, allowed herself to be interviewed since and I think she regretted participating in the book. And she gave so much information and background about her childhood, um, about her court, her court, the courting with Pat, and their yes. and them getting, them courting each other through these love letters. And the love letters are in the book. And there's just a lot of information to try and start gathering all these pieces. And usually, when it's fiction, you're you, you just have the script and you try and uh, make up things to make it all make sense and create some sort of backstory. Sometimes, sometimes it's not necessary. But for this, it was almost like starting to build a character from like so much information and the weirdest things sometimes inspire something. Mm -hmm. And I think I was really, what I learned, what I found interesting, which is something I wouldn't normally make up for a character is like a backstory and their relationship. Like what, what kind of relationship do they have with boys when they're 12? or whatever mm -hmm. and there's a long part of this book about her relationship with boys around that age and for some reason I felt like it made me understand how she functioned in the world mm -hmm. from then on and it mm. <laughs> and then I like that. and so it was something that made me start to build her value system from and it was really this obsessive hold on a a veneer, some sort, and living a very a life that is filled with lots of aspirational dreams and wants. Um, and I do think she's very different than the community that they chose to create, which is a you know these people who are kind of fighting against the culture of what's happening in modern America with the women's liberation movement, civil rights movement. They come back and they try and create this like old school traditional nuclear family and I do think she's kind of a pushing against that a bit and wants to and wants to become more progressive uh, I well I got script one I got the Texas Monthly articles I asked for script two <laughs> I um, I was really interested in this this woman's uh, grip and obsessiveness of uh, withholding um, some sort of veneer and whatever that tension was but I also felt like in the writing there's a lot of humor to be had I wasn't necessarily I didn't realize the Texas Monthly articles were real I thought they were short fiction <laughs> because I I read a lot of short fiction in <laughs> magazines <laughs> and that's what I thought it was um, so it was really more the tone and the character that I was drawn to um, and I was trying to figure out, knowing the direction of what it was, where it was going to go, how to make all these questionable choices make sense and where someone's coming from. So I thought that was intriguing initially. And then talking to Leslie and David, I learned that uh, their hopes of playing with the tone and the feel and this veneer that I was sensing and the humor cutting in was something that they were interested in exploring as well. And so that was that's how I felt, felt about like the first two episodes and so on. It's a hard thing to understand. There is a, a hypnosis scene that happens in this show because apparently it happened, I mean, it did happen in this trial and apparently you can still use hypnosis in trials if both sides agree to it. And I, I didn't, that was one of the first things I, I did was ask David for whoever he was using as a resource for hyp hypnosis therapy. And um, I tried to have a session to understand it. Um, and I, I mean, I certainly wasn't hypnotized. Um, so I was trying to figure out <laughs> the mindset of people who can fall under hypnosis easily. And for some reason to me, it didn't seem like Candy was the type of person, or I certainly hadn't painted her out to be the type of person who can fall under hypnosis easily. But we don't see her at any point actually deal with her anger in any way at this event. And regardless if it were a 
combo of allowing someone to lead you through a process or what, whatever it actually was in that room, I kind of had, I had to make a decision that she's making the choice either like really consciously or not. And, um, but she's making the choice to explore this, this rage that we don't actually see again in the show. And it's this like, deep thing that's stuffed down, um, which I think is a big uh, representation of the place she is in in the world. If there's so much, the, the world of this time, like the set, late 70s, there's so many liberating movements happening in our country and so much progressive thought happening. And these people all chose, um, who are living in the Silicon Prairie, they all chose to um, hold on to a nuclear family the way they wanted it that felt dated or traditional at the time and create literally a new community and that was the beginning of this community and I think she was progressive and there was a tension with her in this town and I feel like there's like I don't think about that while I'm acting but I do think like stepping back a bit there is this anger that I think is that she gets to explore in that in that for the first time the set pieces that were built the the amount of towns, first off. I don't know how many towns we shot in to make two towns look right. What about motels? I mean, <laughs> motels, what? There's three. But we gave lots of places facelifts. I mean, it was really unbelievable to see Suzuki and her team um, in, in real places transform these um, main streets, these motels. I don't remember how much paint was used, but there's like thousands of gallons. 